Okay, ja, da welcome everyone da on a rainy evening. Uh, my name is uh, Hajun Chang. I'm one of the three co-directors of uh, Development Leadership Dialogue Institute, uh, which is uh, being officially launched uh, today. Uh, you know, the world uh, faces serious challenges with development. You know, we have uh, seen a lot of people being lifted out of poverty, largely thanks to the super growth of China, but uh, still 10% of global population live in what is officially defined as extreme poverty, basically around two dollars a day, you know, that, that at least according to one calculation, the average cow in the European Union gets uh, that much uh, subsidy every day. But uh, I think uh, that this uh, poverty figure really underestimates uh, the extent of our challenge, you know, the nearly 30% of the world population over 2.2, 2.3 2 billion people do not even have access to safe drinking water, yeah? Never mind that uh, safe housing, sanitation. So we uh, are still facing this huge challenge and uh, we are living in a very complicated and difficult times, you know. There, there are geopolitical shifts, demographic uh, shifts, new technologies, and above all, the challenge of climate change and other ecological uh, breakdowns. So the this is a time when we need uh, people from different countries and different sectors of the development community, if you like, uh, government, private sector, civil society, trade unions, international organizations, to come and uh, uh, put their heads together to come up with solutions uh, to this uh, the complex and uh, difficult uh, problems. And DLD was uh, the set up to help that uh, cooperation with uh, generous uh, support from Hyundai Motor UK and Kia UK. We will, the, in the coming years, provide a forum for you know, conversations, debates, workshops, and other ways of uh, dialogue and learning together so that, that uh, we can uh, help uh, the world uh, come up with that more that kind of uh, reason and that, that, that inclusive uh, solutions uh, to our development challenges. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Adam Habib, uh, Director of SOAS, uh, to give his uh, speech. Uh, I'll yeah, vacate this uh, place. Uh, but I'll keep coming back. So, uh, don't think I have to do uh, thank you, Arjun. Uh, colleagues, friends, um, I do want to say thank you, but I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that this is going to be really a speech. Speech is more than... Uh, I thought I was doing, I am going to do some welcoming remarks and say a few words about what I think this institute is about, this institute and this partnership is about. But let me kick off by saying it is a really wonderful opportunity and an honor to be launching this Development Leadership Dialogue Institute uh, here at SOAS. Uh, we welcome a number of colleagues uh, from Hyundai Motors UK, Kia UK, and the Hyundai Motor Group in South Korea. And there are a couple of uh, individuals that I want to mention in particular. Uh, and please forgive me if I get the pronunciations of the name wrong. Um, Executive Vice Pre President of Hyundai Motor Group Global Strategy, of course, Jung Soo Kim, the Executive Vice President of the Hyundai Group's uh, Hyundai Group's, Group's Business Intelligence Unit, Gion Kim, President of Hyundai Motors, Ashley Andrew, and of course, President of Kia UK, Port, Paul Fulpot. Um, 
this institute is going to be managed by our departments of economics and development studies, both of which have extensive experience in partnering with institutions around the world. It's an enormously generous gift at 5.8, 5.82 million pounds. And frankly, I want to uh, thank all of you for the initiative in this regard. Let me say a couple of things about what I think we're doing. This morning I was in a conversation with the Standard Group uh, in South Africa. Uh, and they were having a climate change conversation. A conversation on how Africa can begin to think through and address the strategic challenges uh, around addressing climate change. And the big debate was in thinking through a green industrialization strategy, in thinking through an developmental trajectory for Africa, the big debate emerged around initially around what to do about the mining industry, what to do about fossil fuels, what to do about coal mining. And then the real debate quickly shifted to the motor industry and the incredible capacity of the motor industry both to manage the challenges of this transition in the form of rethinking how to engage in the motor industry, how to restructure the, the motor industry in the African continent. But as importantly, because all of the estimates are suggesting that in the next 50 to 80 years, Africa would be one of the biggest markets for the procurement of motor vehicles. Partly because there's so few people who own cars, and partly because as the development trajectory takes off, you're going to need mobility to enable the development and economic development potential. And I was kind of thinking about this and thinking about this conversation I'm going to do today. So three or four hours later, I'm coming to welcome the Hyundai group here. And what am I coming them to welcome in? I'm, call, I'm welcoming them here for assisting in the development of an institute that is developing the leadership training to enable the green industrialization of the African continent. And so in many ways, it's, it's, it's fortuitous. Um, and that's what I really wanted to put under the agenda today. You know, so has exists for 110, 108, 109 years. And originally, it was established to train people for the, uh, the colonies. It was meant to train administrators. That's why we focus on languages, and that's why we focus on culture. So that colonial administrators could understand the people that they were going to rule and think through how to subjugate them in nuanced ways. That was the agenda. In the last hundred years, that agenda has changed in quite fundamental ways. It is now, in many ways, an institution that trains to disrupt the world order, to enable us to restructure the world in which social justice is its core. And our argument is that each of all of our challenges in this historical moment are transnational in character. Whether you think it's climate change, whether you think it's pandemics, whether you think it's inequality or social and political polarization. And if we're going to address those transnational challenges of our time, we need global science and technology, but we need local knowledge. You can have a pen in the pandemic. You had a vaccine that was deployed in South Korea, that was deployed in New York City, and that was deployed in Tokyo. The consequences of the deployment of that vaccine were fundamentally different. Why? Because culture matters, because history matters, because institutional architecture matters. And in a sense, bringing local knowledge and global science and technology in conversations with each other. And that's the purpose of the SOAS agenda. It's the strategic response that SOAS has developed for this historical moment. And what is this agenda of this institute? It's a partnership between Hyundai and SOAS. SOAS, a university in London, 
but dedicated to understanding Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Partnering a corporate entity, a global company whose headquarters are in, are in South Korea. And what is it funding is an industrialization strategy on the African continent. It's thinking through transnational challenges, imagining how to address transnational challenges, and in partnership between a public institution, a higher education institution, and a corporate entity. One in the heart of London, another, at least its headquarters, in the heart of South Korea. Partnering together to think through an industrialization in partnership with institutions in Africa. What it speaks about is transnational challenges. It speaks about bringing together capabilities from across sectors, and it brings together an alignment of strategies. Hyundai, I would imagine, in part is doing this for social justice ends. But in part, I'm imagining you're doing this for because you're thinking about a sustainable business strategy over the next 100 years. These goals need not be mutually exclusive. We can bring them in alignment with each other. And in a sense, that's the real purpose of this agenda. And so I want to bring this to an end by saying, Suez is meant to be a bridge. It's meant to be an intellectual and academic bridge between sectors, between nations, between bringing our academy and our students in conversation with corporate partners. And this institute is one significant element in that. So I thank you to all of you for coming. I know some of you have traveled from far. Thank you very much for the sponsorship. And we look forward to a fruitful partnership in the coming months and years. Thank you very, very much. Okay, let me now uh, invite uh, Mr. Hung Soo Kim, uh, the Executive uh, Vice President uh, in charge of uh, the Global uh, Strategy Office at uh, Hyundai Motor Group. Uh, good evening, uh, distinguished guests. I'm honored to join you all uh, at today's opening ceremony of Development Leadership Dialogue Institute. My name is Hung Soo Kim, Executive Vice President and Head of Global Strategy Office of Hyundai Motor Group. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to express my sincere uh, gratitude uh, to Professor Adam Habib, uh, Director of SOAS, uh, University of London, uh, for his warm welcome. And I also would like to thank Professor Hajun Chang, Professor Christopher Kramer, and Professor Jonathan D. Jong, as well as other SOAS officials for their dedication in making this partnership possible. Uh, as you all know very well, uh, Africa is often referred uh, as a, a land of opportunity as it has a, a rapidly growing population abundant resources, and potential renewable energy. And moreover, Africa is moving uh, toward securing in independent uh, economic uh, growth and strengthening alliance among its uh, nations. For instance, uh, as shown with the launch of African Continental FTA uh, in 2019. However, uh, most sub-Saharan uh, countries still need additional assistance uh, for infrastructure and institutional reformation from the global community. We believe that uh, Africa should not be merely viewed as a new business market. Uh, it will be essential for the global community to join hands to support Africa build a desirable future. In this regard, uh, Hyundai Motor Group will be able to leverage our expertise and experience to help pave the pathway and achieve fundamental growth for African nations. Hyundai Motor Group's founder, the late chairman, Jung Ju Young, uh, built the entire business from the ground up and contributed to the industrialization of Korea. Today, Hyundai Motor Group's business portfolio not only covers mobility, 
but also steel making, construction, logistics, finance, and IT services. Moving forward, uh, we aim to look beyond short-term business performance figures and ultimately realize our vision together for a better future for all. We believe that the spirit and entrepreneurship of Hyundai Motor Group could be an inspiration for many in Africa. This is why we made the decision to support uh, the establishment and operation of DLD Institute. With DLD, uh, we will participate in the dialogue for sustainable growth of developing nations, including the African regions. Uh, through the platform, enabled by the DLD Institute, we look forward to collaborating with the future leaders of Africa to identify how these nations can successfully realize industrialization. I am certain that experts and leaders of various fields will be able to build meaningful relationships, attending DLD workshops, public conversations, and regular seminars. This interdisciplinary and cross-sectional conversation will guide the future leaders of developing nations, including Africa, to improve relevant policies and development plans. Hyundai Motor Group will fully support DLD's activities and also encourage the participation of our group's future leaders in these sessions. Finally, I hope the partnership between our two organizations to be the cornerstone of making progress for humanity in Africa. We look forward to embarking on a journey together for long-term cooperation. Thank you very much. Okay, the, we are now going to take a small the photo opportunity the, the, to commemorate uh, the you know, uh, signing of the contract. Uh, so if uh, Adam and uh, Mr. Philpot and Mr. Andrew and uh, Executive Vice uh, President uh, Kyun Kim, uh, if uh, you can come to... So... Uh, yeah, the two of you uh, will hold this... Do I catch this? Yeah. 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 Right, uh, now we, yeah, in the anticipation of but, uh, what we'll be doing in the coming years, uh, we are going to have a conversation uh, between three prominent uh, development uh, scholars and practitioners. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, David Pilling, uh, the Africa editor of uh, the Financial Times, uh, moderating. And three panelists, uh, we have uh, the Professor Akebe Okbe, the former the minister and advisor to the President of, uh, uh, sorry, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, someone who, yeah, I would say was uh, the architect of uh, Ethiopian economic uh, the miracle. And uh, we have uh, the Professor uh, <coughs> Naila Kabir the, from LSE, the, an expert on the many development issues, including poverty, gender, and uh, so on. And we have uh, our own uh, Christopher Kramer, the, uh, 
uh, who is an expert on the, the African economies, uh, but uh, the focusing on uh, poverty, the agriculture, the violence and conflict. Uh, so the, can I invite the panelists and the moderator the, to the... And the topic of the conversation is ending poverty in the 21st century, question mark. Yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> we are not uh, presuming anything, but uh, the, we'll have a nice uh, conversation on the, whether this uh, is possible, even something uh, the, that we should uh, even try. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so my name's David Pilling. I'm the Africa editor of the Financial Times. I've been on the Financial Times for more years than I'd care to tell you. Uh, and I used to be the Asia editor of the Financial Times. So there may be, uh, and I think it's very, uh, it's appropriate and it's, it would be difficult to avoid talking about, you know, what happened in Asia. If we're, if we're looking at Africa, which is where the majority of poor people live in the world today, it would be very difficult to do that without talking about um, uh, Asia. And I think in, in different ways, um, uh, each of our panelists have already been um, uh, introduced, um, so I won't repeat that. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just say a few things. Um, uh, Nyla, uh, in the middle here, uh, is Professor of London School of Economics. Uh, she works primarily on poverty, gender, uh, and social policy issues, and she's written widely uh, on gender development and Bangladesh, and I would like to maybe talk to her about Bangladesh uh, at some point. Um, Christopher Kramer, the end there, a professor of political economy uh, of development at SOAS, his expertise in development, the political economy of war, poverty, uh, and rural labour markets, and also, it says on Wikipedia, of the cashew nut. He doesn't know this but I'm going to ask him about the cashew nut uh, <laughs> um, and Arkabi Okubai. So we've got two academics here. Um, Arkabi is also an academic, um, now attached to um, SOAS, but he has a very different um, trajectory as well. Uh, I don't know if he'll object to me calling him uh, a guerrilla fighter, which I think he was. I've seen a photograph of him where he looked quite like Che Guevara um, in his uh, house in Addis Ababa. Uh, so he was uh, with the TPLF which fought uh, a war of liberation against the Derg, Mengistu's Derg, uh, which became victorious in 1991, and which, which then kind of formed the heart of um, uh, a government that stayed in power for um, more than two decades, um, primarily under a man, I'm sure many of you know, called Mila Zinawi, um, and uh, what Hajun referred to as the Ethiopian economic miracle. I would be careful of that phrase, but... Anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's use it, maybe in quotation marks. Um, uh, certainly something important happened, um, uh, and um, Arkabi was very much part of that, and we're going to um, talk about that. Um, I want to start with Nyla. Um, I think it would be uh, silly to have a conversation about eradicating poverty unless we, uh, without defining what we mean by it. Uh, what do we mean by poverty? Do we mean $2.15 a day, which is the World Bank's uh, very generous um, uplifting from one ninety a day? So those extra 25 cents, I'm sure, uh, will come in handy. Uh, are we talking about Amartya Sen, who talks about capabilities, you know, choice, human dignity, all of these things? Um, uh, are we talking about the SDGs? There are, I can't remember, 6 million, or I think it's 100 and <laughs> quite a lot of SDGs. Um, so even people like me don't really know what they all are. Um, are we talking about those? What, what are we talking about, Nala? Um, is this on? I think you've got to press that very button. Yeah. Um, all right, yes. Uh, I, I'm going to start by saying that while it's, you know, uh, much more acceptable now to uh, be very critical of the idea of absolute poverty, I did come from a country uh, which, when I was becoming a student, was absolutely, absolutely poor. And it was, I think, the second poorest country in the world after either Rwanda or Ethiopia, depending on which uh, data you looked at. And so for me... The idea that we had to tackle some of the basic needs that how you talked about water, etc., that you know, we, we couldn't think about anything else unless we talked about food, water, health, and so on. And it seemed like absolute poverty 
was what was trying to do it. I think over time, I became a bit more um, <laughs> Have a go with this. Um, over time, I became a little bit more cynical for a couple of reasons. One is, as you say, the World Bank's uh, measure was so um, stingy that really all it allowed people to do was to think, you know, eat enough food and get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And then secondly, of course, by keeping our eyes on absolute poverty, we were not paying attention to the increase in inequality. And so it seemed like if we could get you know, people to meet their very basic needs, that was a big step forward. But what we hadn't really understood is that in the meanwhile, the uh, rise of inequality was going to make it harder to meet, to do anything but to address absolute poverty. So I think Sen's ideas about capabilities in moving away from the idea of money as the measure of, of well-being and so on was a big step forward. And he focused our attention on what I think is the most important factor in development, which is the human being. You know, investing in people's health, education, lifelong learning, all of those things seem to be very critical. But I think Sen too has, the, there is a limitation there because he talks about the opportunities for meeting these needs, but not about the processes by which we meet these needs. And so I think the idea of meeting needs in a way that respects people's dignity and all these other things that are not captured by either health outcomes and so on, you know, the processes. So I think we have to move on now from that and to think about what, what it is that inequality doesn't allow us to do. Okay, well, we may come back to that. I'm sure we will. A very quick follow-up. I mean, I wrote a book where I sort of, in a sense, attacked the concept of GDP, and yet it's still a very useful concept, I think. Just remind us, I mean, it doesn't need to be only GDP, life expectancy, um, the fertility rate, which I think is important, although it's controversial. Where has Bangladesh gone from and to? Can you just remind us of the numbers, say, since you were a kid? Well, to now. Uh, it's actually what I'm working on now, so I'll try not to go on about it. And no, li it. literally, I just want the numbers. You know, it was 500 it's, bucks. Now it's, what, $3,500 per capita. I mean, what, what, what was it and what is it now? I can't. Okay. What I can tell you what is, is it that <laughs> its rates of growth are pretty good. Sure. And it's growing it's at about 6%, 7% a year It's supposed to be overcoming now. India, according to the IMF, sure. in terms of its big, per capita GDP growth. But those numbers keep changing. And the fertility rate's gone down from six to two. I mean, it's 2.1. It's actually coming it's replacement to net, value. net replacement rate. Yes. yes. OK, uh, Chris, I would like to bring uh, you in now. Um, so how are we doing? By we, I, I guess I mean humanity. Um, uh, we've you know, had a go at defining poverty. Um, how are we doing? I mean, there's two, there, there are there, there is the sort of, um, there's the Hans Rosling version of this. Um, any of you will know Hans Rosling who's seen his videos. He'll show you, you know, everybody um, poor and dying young in the corner of the graph, and then he winds the graph forward, and uh, you know, people begin to move up, uh, you know, quite dramatically on a log scale. I should, I should say. Um, uh, and he sees in this, you know, sort of tremendous hope, optimism, progress. Um, um, Versus, let's say, Paul Collier, it might be a little unfair to, whose book, The Bottom Billion, was, was basically saying, look, a billion people are, are, are left behind and are cut out of this. Hajin wrote a book called Kicking Away the Ladder. Has the ladder been kicked away? Um, how are we doing, the human race, in eradicating poverty? Just a small little question there. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I'm an academic, so I have to begin by talking about evidence and data. And, and I do want to preface anything I say by saying, and I think this is really important for discussions of poverty, is that, that um, much of what we think we know when we discuss questions like that is clouded by really, really poor evidence. And sometimes that's because people want to fiddle the data, and that goes for the USA and poverty figures in the USA as much as it does for a, a lower middle income country. And sometimes it's just because 
the systems, what we have for you know, the so-called gold standard of living standards measurement surveys, the way of generating comparable data is actually very, very unreliable and comes with massive margins of error. So we have to be terribly careful. So, so that said, um, I think you know, one, one thing, and I, I agree with Nyla, but I think there's still a lot of use in using these poverty lines since Booth and Browntree in the late 19th century, they are absurdly low, really absurd, but they're still useful for mobilizing discussion and, and resources. You could say that in the long run, we, we've been winning. If you look at kind of figures and charts, as you say, the Hans Rosling thing, and you look at the percentage of populations globally that live below this line or that line, it has transformed extraordinarily over the past century or century and a half. But in the short term, we're not winning. It seems like we're not winning, particularly in uh, low-income countries. So there, there are estimates, reliable or otherwise, that, that uh, things pretty much stagnated on the eve of the, or through the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and then the effects of the war in Ukraine and the rising indebtedness and debt service problem. And there seems to be a real problem. So that a lot of the progress, particularly if you use a more meaningful poverty line, which would be higher, it, we're struggling. And yeah, we're struggling sure. on inequality too. By in way. Africa, tens of millions have fallen back into poverty, yeah. almost however you define it. I mean, one important figure I think to think about is uh, infant mortality, child mortality, which has gone down in, you know, across Africa from, you know, if you look at Angola, I don't know, 20 years ago, it was something like 200 per thousand. So one in five kids died before they were five. That's collapsed. I mean, collapsed in a good way. It's now 30, you know, 20, 30, 40, depends on the on the country. That That is real progress. A lot of it has come through development aid and vaccination campaigns. It's not all organic, which I think is is kind of, I think is important. Anyway, I'm not meant to be talking. I'm meant to be asking the questions. Let me move to um, RKB. So what I want to ask RKB is, you know, we saw in Asia uh, countries go from poverty, however defined, let's, let's use GDP. So the classic example is Korea. Uh, it went from when Ghana became independent in, uh, well, I think it was 1957, um, Korea was had half the GDP. I, I'm very suspicious of that number, actually, per capita. I'm, I am really suspicious of that number. But let's, let's, let's just say it was roughly the same. Um, I can tell you today I'm a regular visitor to Ghana. I'm sure m many of you are as well. Um, you know, Korea is some way ahead today um, by, I don't know, 15 times. Something, something like that. Um, Ethiopia kind of deliberately, in some ways, went from, as you say, Nyla, being one of the very poorest countries in the world, a very agrarian um, subsistence in, in many ways, uh, and set off on a de deliberately on an Asian path. Um, okay, but what were you trying to do exactly? Um, uh, how were you trying to do it, and with what success? Uh, thank you. First, I, I would like to highlight that uh, from a policy perspective, I don't see uh, a bulletproof solution or policies that can work in many countries. There are many, many issues that... Uh, we don't really understand as policymakers, uh, and the context is also changing. If we look back Ethiopia 30 years back, and now the external environment is changed, the demography has changed, a lot of changes. Ethiopia was about 45 million in 1990. Now it's 120 million. And urbanization is also uh, accelerating. Uh, so I, I would like to highlight this because in recent years also we have seen uh, poverty becoming a challenge, not only in Africa, but also in advanced economies. So there are many issues that we don't really understand, not only from academic point of view or evidence, but also policy making. Having said this, the biggest challenge for Ethiopia's kickoff, the growth was, first the economic growth in the 80s until 1991 was negative. Negative means the economy has been stagnant for over 10 years. 
So the issue is how do you kick off the economy for, to growth trajectory? And once growth starts, how do you sustain it? And you have to do this with a limited resource. The demands are too many, the choices are quite limited, and what you can have an impact in policy is also an, it's, uh, it's not given. So uh, if we start from the very, some of the factors, 1991, average life expectancy was 44. I raise average life expectancy more important than the conventional meaning of uh, poverty because it's a combination of education, food security, health, rural roads, or etc. And after 25 years, in 2016, it reached 66 years. This is a 22 years uh, addition of average life expectancy. And this is compared with Africa's average, which increased between 50 to uh, 60. Uh, and then the economy also had been able to grow fast. First, between 1994 for about 10 years, 5.5%. And from 2004 for 15 years, consecutively 10.5%. So from the policy perspective, a key uh, lesson we took and the, what we pursued was, first, we didn't find the conventional recommendations, prescriptions, not effective. We have never found them. In every area, the interventions that were made were, I would say, unorthodox or unconventional. Let me give you some uh, specific example, education. In education, uh, the biggest benefit, uh, few years back, the figure was about 30 million were in primary schools. And the biggest benefit of primary schools was the impact on demography and family planning, equally important as the change in education. Because especially girls, early marriage was being able pushed uh, to higher age as education become accessible to girls. And in the other intervention areas also, the one that impacted on poverty overall was not just the policy specifically targeted on poverty, but the focus on growth and structural change. Let's look at energy, for instance. There is no any African countries that has hugely invested uh, like Ethiopia. Despite the poverty level, resource limited, energy was not only expanded, but it was green and it was affordable, the cheapest, making it more accessible. So this has a significant impact in job creation in small towns, in big towns, in manufacturing. Uh, so employment has been at the center, but the interventions have primarily focused on high growth and structural change, and choices need to be made. You have to drop some priority <coughs> and they have to focus. So the key parameter we have used consistently is which one has a significant impact in terms of spillover, in terms of linkage effects. Right. Um, uh, thank, thank you so much. A, a few, few things. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sort of my knowledge of Ethiopia is now receding slightly. But I mean, one of the things that I remember is Mela Zanawi saying uh, he didn't want to measure progress by GDP. He wanted to measure it by how near the nearest rural road was so that farmers could get their crops to market. Um, uh, the energy you talk about. Um, uh, one great symbol of that, of course, is the Grand Renaissance Ethiopian Dam, one of the biggest dams in the world, I think the 11th biggest in the world or something like that, um, which was built entirely from savings yeah. um, that were recycled. I mean, uh, Ethiopia forced up the uh, investment rate in a kind of ruthless <laughs> um, uh, fashion, in a determined fashion. It didn't kind of allow a... Um, uh, an elite to spend money on importing cars and um, going abroad or whatever. It ruthlessly kept control of foreign currency and uh, and pushed that into priority um, areas. Looked very much like what some of the Asian um, um, economies uh, did. Um, I'm fascinated with this kind of Asian uh, African, um, and I may keep coming back to that. But I, but I just wanted one follow up with you. Um, 
RKB. Um, you know, we saw how Japan, Taiwan, Korea, um, uh, the China, big, biggest of all, kind of in a sense followed this this same model. Um, uh, you know, so, some of which, in a sense, I've just described. Much of it unorthodox. Um, but they also clambered aboard, you know, the global free trade. Um, uh, you know, China admitted into the uh, WTO, what, 2001, um, and then just shot up. Um, my question is, um, is, is what those countries did any longer possible? Because some things have changed. They all, they were all they all moved people from the countryside into sweatshops basically in uh, into into the cities and industrialized that way. Um, you know, manufacturing is less and less and less important in the global economy. AI um, automation. Um, also, the WTO is fragmenting. You know, we've got America now breaking the rules, some might say for good reasons, but but, break, but breaking the rules. Um, the WTO, I, I interviewed Ngozi yesterday, uh, the uh, the head of the WTO. Um, it's a shadow of itself, really. It does, it no longer uh, it can enforce those global, those global rules because there's big tensions. In that environment, is it still possible to do a Taiwan, to do a China, to do a South Korea? Or is that, is that age over? Uh, first, I need, uh, we need to look at what has changed. There are some changes we can look at. One is uh, countries like Ethiopia are starting from a very low base, uh, but also where rising emerging economies like China, India are competing in the global economy. Uh, so this means extraordinary effort is required for African countries to build their manufacturing uh, capability. Uh, so this is one, one aspect. Secondly, 50, 60 years ago, climate change or green growth was not an agenda. So it was a brown industrial policy, brown industrialization, putting all the first uh, uh, resources to build industrial capacity. Now, the vulnerability of African countries' economies to climate change has increased it's the most vulnerable continent, but also the direction of investment has also changed. You cannot just invest in fossil oil now. You have to invest in new green industries, but you also have to follow the path of decarbonization. Currently, we at SOAS, uh, with the British Academy uh, grant, uh, we are studying a landmark project uh, on the greening of African economic development, which is a four or five years project funded by uh, British Academy. And the prime focus is how in this environment, industrialization can be greener and carbon neutral. So this is a second element that has changed. In terms of uh, global economic growth also, uh, the global economic growth has uh, decreased its uh, growth rate since uh, 2006 or 2005 for over 15 years. So FDI uh, total size in 2007 was 2 trillion. Now it's about 1 trillion. Uh, and the global economic growth rate has also stagnated. So it means we are playing in a very crowded place. Having said this, I see opportunities in even developing countries like Ethiopia or Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a good example where FDI also can play an important role. So I would like to bring figures here. It required extraordinary effort to attract, for instance, manufacturing FDI to Ethiopia. Between 2007, 2012, for instance, uh, or I can bring the figure between 1991 and 2012, the total FDI inflow to Ethiopia was $5 billion for about 20 years. From 2013, since 2013, the last 10 years, the total FDI has uh, exceeded 30 billion, and 75% is in manufacturing. 
But these results were not automatic. The government had made serious uh, changes in its approach to investment. How do you target companies? How do you target sectors? What incentives should you give? How do you manage FDI to a productive direction? How do you build industrial ecosystem? Manufacturing cannot uh, thrive without an industrial ecosystem that will allow firms to, to grow and be profitable. And the industrial parks, which has, which is now considered as a major uh, positive uh, impact, with positive impact in Ethiopia, was also implemented after 2014. And in this whole process, one key ingredient was all these new policy interventions were uh, the result of assessing what is happening and the shortcomings and the variations, but secondly also studying critically the uh, experience of various countries, both on the positive and negative side. Let's say when we adopted the industrial hubs policy, the industrial parks policy, we studied six countries. In Africa, Nigeria and Mauritius. In Asia, Singapore, Vietnam, South Korea, and China, and Vietnam. Uh, and based on this, it was not a matter of copying. First, by increasing the number of countries we want to emulate, we have to diversify. And we also targeted the learning, and we came up with a new approach. So the new industrial hubs policy, which is part of industrial policy, is uh, building sustainable industrial parks. Every park, park built has to be uh, eco-industrial park or a green industrial park. Uh, and also, every park has to be specialized and sector-based so that linkages can be promoted. So my belief is industrialization is possible, but it has to be carbon neutral. And every country has also to adapt industrial policy to its uh, uh, peculiar situation. But an extraordinary effort and commitment from the government uh, is required because without such uh, interventions, the level of commitment we have seen in East Asia or even China now or Vietnam, uh, it will not be possible to, uh, to develop industrial capacity. Okay, I'm going to go to Bangladesh in a second, but before that, why don't we go to the cashew nut? Um, pe people will know, you know, uh, um, Ethiopia has had some success in uh, increasing its manufacturing industry. Much of Africa has not. Um, manufacturing as a percentage of GDP in Africa has gone backwards over the last 20 years. Um, a good good example where actually something might be happening is Benin, uh, where it's one of the biggest producers of cashew nuts, I think, uh, maybe in the world. It's certainly one of the biggest in Africa. Uh, all their cashew nuts until a few years ago. Um, cashew nuts, I don't know quite how they look when they're grown, but they do not look like the cashew nut that you eat in a packet. They look totally different. And you need to do something to them. I have no idea what, but, you know, there's a machine involved and a process. Then you put them in a packet and then you sell them at Harrods or WH Smith's. Um, none of those were coming from Benin. They all went from Benin to Vietnam, um, uh, where all of that happened. Uh, and the Beninois got, you know, almost no value. This is... Unfortunately, the story all across Africa, uh, fish, oil, um, cotton, uh, ha, ha, what are the obstacles for transforming a, a, um, a cashew nut in place uh, um, and, uh, and how do you overcome those obstacles? Well, you, you can do it in a frying pan at the side <laughs> of the road. It's not that hard with a knife, but, but, but to do it properly, it's, it's very difficult and I can go on about. <laughs> but but, but, but yeah. you see the point but, I'm making. I'm making a bigger point about the, the, the obstacles to industrialization, which starts obstacles. with processing, you know. There are many obstacles. Um, and, and just to kind of draw a contrast um, in a way to, to, to highlight one form of obstacle is a contrast between Ethiopia that Arkebi has been talking about. And when I was first doing some work on cashew nuts in Mozambique in the, in the mid-1990s, and the difference is, in a way... It's what, what I, or maybe he, call the Sinatra approach to development policy. As Mellers, your former colleague, uh, used to say, not, he wasn't just copying South Korea or, or, any, or Taiwan or anywhere else, but 
trying to go around and work out how have other people addressed this problem? How can we try to find solutions that may or may not work and try them? And, you know, it's called the Sinatra method because it's, we did it our way, right? <laughs> now, the difference is um, with Mozambique emerging from war, as Ethiopia was in the early 90s, so was Mozambique. Mozambique came under such intense pressure from external sources and became, if you like, to, to put it over simply, um, dependent on external ideas. And those ideas were, they were kind of high school textbook economics. Um, there was a specific World Bank paper on the cashew sector mm -hmm. that just said, look, it's very, very easy. You just liberalize everything all at once. You don't need these factories and there's nothing you can do to save them and get rid of your tariffs on raw cashew nuts and all will be well in, in a few days, more or less. You know? and, and actually what happened was Mozambique, which had been the world's biggest producer of cashew nuts, had been a major processor, lost its processing industry. We talk about poverty, the single most important mechanism, I would venture, for poverty reduction, it's historically always been thus, is jobs in higher productivity sectors. And what happened in that episode was a destruction of a lot of particularly women's jobs in cashew processing. And it took, if you're very benign and positive about the story, you say, it took a long time for some kind of cashew sector to, to recover. That's a lot of people's lives damaged in, in the meantime. If you're a little bit more negative about it, you say it never happened, and there was a massive lost opportunity. So one source of the constraint is to do with the technology and to do with, with trading rules and phytosanitary rules and so on and so forth. But I think those things are possible to overcome. And yes. I think if you look at the variations across countries, even within continents, you see that some governments are more effective in collaboration with private sector actors in overcoming those barriers. So a lot of the barriers are perhaps more fundamentally to do with the politics of coming around together around a coherent strategy, as there was in Ethiopia, and uh, breaking through that, that power of or dependency on external ideas that are very often just, you know, it would be okay if they were great ideas, but very often they're not. Right. Okay. Well, we could go back to that maybe, but let's, let's see how much time we have. I would like to turn to Bangladesh, um, which probably comes somewhere in between. There wasn't a kind of a thought out industrial, pol it was kind of a mess. And yet something happened that worked in its own way. Um, what has gone right in Bangladesh and how uh, copyable <laughs> is, is that? Can you define the Bangladesh model? You know, my least favorite word in development studies is replicability, <laughs> because it's just, you know, something happens right and you somehow think, but if you want to do it your way, you know, that means you take what's, what works somewhere and you do something else. I think with Bangladesh, the South Korean model, the, the East Asian model, was an important one because of its labor-intensive promise. I think the advantage Bangladesh had, let us say, over India was pragmatism. It wasn't tied to a particular ideology of uh, state-led you know, industrialization and so on. And I'm very struck by the fact that in India, they talk about jobless growth which is actually a recent phenomenon. But if you look at the Indian trajectory, it's been jobless all along. Mm -hmm. You know, it has always focused on heavy industry. And now the growth is driven by services, but by uh, ICT, you know, the kinds of services that don't generate the jobs you're talking about. I think this, the, where Bangladesh went right is that it prioritized strategies that would generate jobs not just the garment sector, which is the one that gets all the publicity, but also non-farm, off-farm enterprise. You know, so you had rural diversification, so people weren't stuck in a stagnating agricultural sector. Rural enterprise, rural industry has grown. So I, you know, uh, I, I'm looking at the history of Bangladesh right now and what went right, and the word pragmatism comes up again and again. Whether it's about the way that the government decided, successive governments took the advice of the IMF and the World Bank, but tried to adjust it 
to what would work for its own people. Yes. So that pragmatism has been important, but pragmatism also on the ground. You know, I think I don't like these uh, psychological uh, explanations of people. However, <laughs> there's a guy called Clarence Maloney who talked about pragmatic individualism in Bangladesh. And I think one of the things that's done is it's turned a rural population away from, they had to get out of farming, but it's turned them into entrepreneurs. And if you look at migration and the amount of remittances that are coming from wherever you go in the world, there's a Bangladeshi trying to sell you something. And you know, okay, we didn't manage to generate those jobs inside the country, but that push to allow people to migrate and short-term contracts and so on. So I think that thing about where will the jobs come from? We don't always have a choice. Yeah, sometimes it's from outside. Yeah, yes. remittances is a very understudied, or yes. certainly in journalism, we don't write about it nearly enough. Well, uh, it's a huge source of foreign exchange for Bangladesh after garments. Sure. Um, th- this may come out wrong, but I want to talk about violence. <laughs> um, a lot of the poor people, the poorest, <laughs> a lot of the poorest people in the world uh, live in places that are plagued by violence. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the Sahel. I was in Niger last year. Niger just had a had a coup. Uh, Niger is surrounded by countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, uh, northern Nigeria, where Boko Haram is uh, very active. Um, in fact, when I was there, they were very active. I, there was like shooting <laughs> at us. <laughs> um, uh, you know, poverty can beget violence, and violence <laughs> uh, can beget um, poverty. There are there are quite a lot of these pockets. I mean, the, the Horn of Africa is, an, is another part of the world. Haiti is somewhere else that one might mention. Um, you can look at parts of the Middle East today, Gaza. Uh, you know, that's a whole other story, but maybe it's connected. Um, you know, the, the question, and it was a question mark, eradicating poverty in the 21st century question mark that would mean eradicating violence would it not in the 21st century otherwise the answer to that question is no um so so one part of that answer is that that, that violence often constitutes what, what poverty is um people living lives that we might describe as poor very often are experiencing uh, quite close at hand violence and coercion and not necessarily from an armed conflict can be within their households, for example, or from the, the, the structures around them. But the, the, the broader, bigger question is really, really difficult to answer because we got tied into a, what's often, I think, a very oversimplified thing, which is, you know, um, you, you can't address poverty without addressing violence. You can't address violence without addressing poverty. And I think we get kind of sucked into that because it's a nice-sounding nexus or, 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 or trap. And and it, we need to remember also um, that poverty on its own doesn't necessarily breed violence. When you combine a lot of poverty with a lot of oppression, uh, with with severe forms of inequality or something, then maybe more likely to. So and guns. To I mean, in, what, Libya, yeah. for example, collapsing. All the guns flowed into for the sure. Sahel, and off you went. So we have to put it in, in that context. But the other, the other thing we have to be very careful about is assuming that um, whatever we talk about r- reducing poverty, development policies, that we somehow think those are necessarily always violence reducing. Development everywhere, I would suggest, has been uh, capitalist development has been highly contradictory, very uneven, and brutal. And it often involves different forms of of violence and and conflict. Um, So it's worth talking about these things, but so long as we don't pretend that once we've got nice policies, everybody's going to be happy with them, because it creates winners, it creates losers, and usually, as you say, when there's a means of violence hanging around. Um, And that can be, by the way, self-directed, and it doesn't have to be a gun. If you look at... Shock therapy in Russia and the end of the Soviet Union, what happened to life expectancy there was very, very rare outside of a a major famine or or war. And it was effectively a kind of form of mass alcoholic suicide, self-directed 
So the means of violence can be an AK-47 or a bottle of vodka. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Again, I, I could go back, but let me, um, let me move on. I mean, we've talked, in a sense, about um, the development path, the industrialization path, the following some kind of model or picking and choosing, the kind of dragging yourself up um, uh, form of eradicating poverty. There may be other forms. Um, the, 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 uh, we've had a go, I guess, uh, maybe in a limited way or maybe in an ill-advised way or maybe in a just totally blind way, and I'm talking about development aid. So there's a whole massive development aid or whatever you want to call it, industry out there, uh, billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars, you know, from um, individual countries, from multilateral institutions, from uh, donors like Gates, etc., who puts in huge amounts of money. Um, is this, uh, and I'd like to ask all three of you really, actually this question, is this part of eradicating poverty, question mark? Is it an irrelevance? Um, is it useful sometimes? Is it a catalyst? Is it a, does it create perverse incentives? What, what can we say sensibly about um, what, what you might call development aid? Sensibly, we can say all the above, I think. Um, you know, I think it can be uh, effective, but it goes wrong uh, very, very frequently. And, and the problems are when, when it, it comes, when it's fickle, when, when, when the kind of fads and fashions change rapidly and people on the receiving end having to deal with that. Uh, it goes wrong when the receiving end has got complicated politics of handling it. So it's, you know, there isn't a kind of iron law of development is wonderful, development is, is terrible. So I think it can when it's, if you like, aligned with coherent strategies. I think it's fundamentally not the main answer. And I, that comes to states and their policies and their social safety nets that Nyla knows more about. But I, just to start it. That's a very good start. Yes, Nyla, I'd be interested in your view. I, I think... You know, development aid has been a very critical um, input into a lot of people, uh, countries. I, it is a very poison chalice because uh, it comes with its own strings. But I'm hopeful that given what we're facing in the future, given what we're facing in terms of climate change, given the fact that unless all of us get our act together, get our industrialized industries green and our agriculture more, uh, self-sufficient, etc. That it's it's in the interests of development providers to get things right. You know, up till now, I think it, it's been largely driven by the interests of donors or their view of what the world needs. But I think, given what we are now facing, and that it is going to affect us all equally if we don't get it right, I'm hoping that there will be a very strong stake that people on the receiving end and people on the giving end will have to do it a bit more sustainably, I guess. Sustainably. Thoughtfully, sustainably, yeah. Okay, but again... Um... Yeah, t thank you. I, I just want to uh, respond to this important point. I feel this is a very important point because there is huge il illusion, even with us among African policymakers and Africans to see uh, and just waiting for uh, donor money. My understanding and my experience tells me the answer is not yes or no. Uh, I can bring multiple uh, examples where the scenarios were completely different. Let's look at Grand Renaissance Dam. This is a hydropower to be built on uh, Nile River and the main rationale was this is a green energy and as the scale is the most significant, 6,600 megawatt, uh, the price will go down with scale. Uh, and uh, my government looked for resources. No one was willing to make this resource available. Not the World Bank, not any European country, not even the Chinese. And there was a strong lobby because of the geopolitical element. 
So here what the government decided was, we cannot leave this to be sabotage. We have, this is a national project. We need to mobilize resources. So the government allocated from its own treasury money, significant. But secondly also, it, uh, 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 it launched uh, a grand renaissance uh, dam bond uh, mobilizing the whole country. And uh, this is a mega project over six or seven uh, billion dollars, including the high tension transmission. So this is the path pursued, a very challenging one, but ultimately it's going to be rewarding. But if we look at the other aspect, let's look defeat, for instance, or UK assistance, Ethiopia has been the biggest recipient uh, of uh, defeat assistance some years back. And the main reason donors want to work with Ethiopian government is they knew that they cannot put their policies. And I just want to bring uh, uh, some uh, story uh, we're discussing with uh, one of the professors here in, in London who has been engaged in Africa. Uh, and there was another guest. And the guest asked him, uh, what is the difference you saw between Ethiopia and other African countries? And what that professor, anonymous, let's say, mentioned was in Ethiopia, you have to argue, you can never convince the policymakers. But once you reach an agreement, things move at the speed of light. In some governments, you discuss and they say, okay, and then things don't move. So everyone wanted to be part of the process, but also we had to come with our own agenda. If there are many cases where assistance uh, played important role. World Bank is a major finance, financing of road projects. It's a very, very important lending agency in terms of roads, but we haven't used it for railway. Uh, on the other aspect, on industrial park, it has financed it. So, in health, we have been able to use many donor funds for uh, health infrastructure, for education. So the issue is, first, you need to have your own plan. You cannot plan after yep. looking at the fund. And secondly, once you have a, a plan, you cannot expect all the donors just to follow you. You have to negotiate. Yes. You have to find midway. And then you have to show uh, an excellent level of Performance, yep. because no one wants to join who is not which a project which is not successful. Uh, when there is success, everyone tries to be part of it. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to open up to the uh, audience now. I mean, there's a very good book called by Stefan Durkheim called Gambling on Development. Uh, the basic thesis is you don't develop unless you really want to, unless the government's basically decided that's what it's going to do. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, it was a very simple but very quite compelling thesis, I think. Um, questions? Who would like to? I can't resist the opportunity. It seems to me that would it be nice to hear your thoughts on the value of political leadership? Leadership. Uh, leadership. Because it seems to me, I mean, if you're looking at Ethiopia, there's a question of a particular leadership that enabled all of that. You spoke about the case, about the cashew nuts and the role of political leadership, the failures of political leadership <coughs> in Mozambique. How important in this development trajectory, you spoke about pragmatism yeah. and the role of that. How important is political leadership? Well, I think that's a good question. And in a sense, Durkin's aren't trying to answer that. I mean, he's saying it's without it, you don't even start, is what Durkin would answer. But how do you see that? I mean, and we might even refine that question. What kind of political leadership? You know, some people say you don't develop unless you have a kind of a dictator or a strong man. Others say, you know, democracy is the best way. Clearly, I mean, I think n neither of those are true, actually. Um, but political leadership, maybe quickly, each of you, and then we'll go back to the audience. Well, or, yeah. I think you can, we've, we went a long way without very good leadership. Exactly, right? yeah, that's true. And we had a very good, strong civil society that compensated for that is true. pretty awful leadership. But it comes to a halt. You know, I think the future we, but for me the question is how do you get it? <laughs> 
Yeah, what a country we're in for you to be asking that, 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 that question. And, and I know where you come from, Adam, so it is a very pertinent question in, in, in South Africa, obviously. I mean, you, yeah, Nyla's right. It's a, it, it's a black box. It's a difficult thing to explain, but it's fundamentally important. I mean, I've, I've had the, 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 the privilege, the, the, the luck to, to work quite closely with senior leadership in, uh, during the transition in South Africa, in, in, in Ethiopia and Mozambique, and the, the variations are, are, are astonishing, and I think they, they, they account for a huge amount of, of policy direction, and not just pol headline policies, but, but how they're implemented. It's kind of, in a way, that next level. It's the follow-through, rather than coming up with a, with a beautiful strategy. It's, can you implement it? That, I think, is a, a level of leadership that we maybe don't talk quite enough about in these things. Me you know, top just, very quickly, <laughs> just quickly say sure. one other thing is that we've a lot of this conversation has been about growth and development strategies, etc., and not enough about poverty. And I think you can ask, you know, you can get very good leadership that allows a country to grow, but does nothing on people in poverty. And then you can get very good leadership that actually looks to how the development strategy addresses growth. Sure. I mean, I would say you can't alleviate poverty without what we might call growth. Uh, but you can, you can have a considerable amount of progress at the bottom without necessarily having grown a lot at the top. That's true. Yeah, my uh, understanding is that uh, without uh, a strong political leadership, it will be difficult to sustain long-term growth. But I don't consider this as given because the political leadership also evolves. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to bring the uh, Taiwanese example. Chiang Kai-shek was the most uh, backward rightist force which was kicked off from mainland. But once they are in Taiwan, they had to review the whole process and they were compelled to change their direction. So what I would like to say is first the political leadership, we shouldn't look at it like you know static. There is usually a discussion is this South African government developmental or Ethiopian government developmental or not? You cannot categorize, it's a continuum. The second element is, with the same leadership, there are times where uh, not good policies are adopted, not good strategies are adopted. And there are cases where, uh, where the right strategies are also uh, put. And this shows us the learning process. The, so here we need to link it with the policy making, the learning component, and gradually also the political economy structure also shifts, and that one puts pressure. So we shouldn't just say political leadership is everything. Uh, we have to look at it as a critical uh, 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 element, central element, but that evolves through time. I have a question that would follow on from that, but I think it's only fair to ask, let the audience ask some questions. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me a chance. Um, I'm Oh Ryung Jin from Korea, and then uh, it's, it can be a bit sensible question about development, but uh, when we talk about Asian development model, it can be seen very efficient and effective, but uh, it's more about focusing on government role, like uh, collaboration between government sectors and private sector. But it always bears a, a little bit of a justification of a power monopolized or the dictatorship. So uh, interstate agents like uh, UN or ECHO, usually when they provide the fund or they do the aid, and then they put lots of requirement of a human right or the democratization. So isn't it the time that we also review and we have to talk about uh, because it's not compatible about you know the democratic and also focusing too much on the like uh, giving a power to the government for the driving about the development. State. So, what is, what is your question that that development aid should be divorced from uh, stipulations about democracy? Uh, 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 no, no, I don't insist, but I want to know about your opinion about this because what level can be, we can put the standard because international level because. It's very difficult uh, ideological issue, right? Yeah, I don't know who, if anyone wants to tackle that one. Okay, okay, babe. If I correctly understood, uh, international organizations, or let's say advanced economies, 
should not put conditionalities linked with democracy or human rights, etc. And my view, my view is absolutely right. They shouldn't put any condition. And one of the problem with donor fund is they try to put by their own parameter to measure which one is democratic, which is not, uh, which is undemocratic. And they, it's not isolated from the interests of, let's say, former historically linked countries. Mm -hmm. The situation we see in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, SAL uh, countries is not just uh, the problem of the coup d'etat or whatever. It's also linked with intervention of many uh, external forces. Uh, so national interest comes, and my a key concept, donors, if they need to pursue and give assistance is they have to give assistance and they shouldn't put pressure on what policy needs to be adapted and they shouldn't put condition. Who is the, who is the ultimate judge on democracy, by, by the way? No one. I think we could go back into that, but, I, but I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave that uh, that where it stands. Maybe I'd just like to ask one final um, question. Unfortunately, it's a it's a big one in a sense, which is um, state formation. I mean, it's it's almost quite difficult to to define what be what we mean by that. But um, I wonder if e economies that are going to do well and that are going to do well in um, uh, tackling poverty are ones where there is a. a a strong state that doesn't mean a dictatorial state at all it means it means a strong sense of a state it could mean very high literacy going back a long way um uh, a sense of uh, uh rule of law could it could mean a sense of hierarchy a sense of um unity that's been forged say in china where um uh you know the, the the idea of the Han people has been kind of, in a sense, invented and mythologized. I'm thinking of that because of Africa, because many countries in Africa are 60 or 70 year old years old, and they're not really countries. Or you could argue that they're not. They were formed by in Berlin um, by uh, colonial cartographers, uh, and they're you know some of them only kind of only sort of just about feel like countries. Um, how can you say anything about <laughs> state formation and whether that is a kind of um, a prerequisite for the kind of growth that would begin to eliminate poverty? <laughs> I told you it was a big question. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> um, I mean, broadly speaking, yes, but I, I think you're, you're, you're talking about two things in a way. There's a sense of nation and a sense of state, and they're not necessarily quite mm -hmm. quite the same. Um, some of what you were talking about, David, I, I, I think uh, makes us think about kind of histories of, of, of a sense of sort of survival almost at a national level or at a regime level. And, and some of the policies, had you, oh, sorry, Akhavi mentioned uh, Chiang Kai-shek, Taiwan, so on and so forth, but there are, there are other examples where actually policies were forged in the heat of having to try and survive. And so that threat, whether it's internal or external or a combination of the two, has often been a really important part of the process. And it's a part of the process where you end up having to not have a massive divide between elites and people. And, and that something might be forged within that, that may, as Nyla says, we haven't talked quite enough about poverty, may end up generating things that, that, that make a difference there. I mean, that's the, the beginnings of an answer. It's a, it, it needs another hour, I think. So, so Nyla, why don't I give you the last word and forget the state formation question. Why don't yeah, you, you want to address poverty? Just, just address it. How would you like to address it? <laughs> Actually, I, I'm going to go back to something that Chris said and that I didn't pick up on. And I would like to put two words together, two concepts, and that social protection and synergy. And the reason is, and I think social protection, safety nets, if you like, can be used in ways that left to themselves, markets, civil societies, and so on, don't, uh, don't address. And that is the kind of structural gaps that prevent people who are in disadvantaged situations from reaching opportunities. And synergies, because if we go back to Bangladesh, and if we go back to something that the new UNESCO report talks about, is there are certain places if you invest, 
they generate multiplier effects, right? And education is one of them, right? Health is one of them. And there are certain things that are affected by what you invest in, and life expectancy is that. So I, and it, it, it might be the state, it might be somebody else, but designing the things that are missing, which is through social protection, in order to generate the kinds of bridges that you need to get poor people to opportunities is, I think, and what happened in Bangladesh was that synergy. You had family planning, children's education, maternal, all happening together so that they could feed off each other. And on the state thing, again, I think the contrast between Bangladesh and Pakistan is precisely that even if we didn't have a very strong state, but we had a coherent sense of national identity. Whereas Pakistan has been made up of four or five very different, all pulling in different direction, and nobody's strong enough to build that sense of national identity and you know, a national project. Thank you very much. I think we should leave it there. Um, but thank you very much to the audience. Thank you, of course, especially to the panel. Not an easy topic, but we gave it our best. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Jonathan Dijon. I'm one of the three co-directors. I just want to, we're running a little over time, just close very briefly. Just first of all, to announce there'll be a reception um, outside. You'll be directed to the next building in the cloisters of the Senate House. We'll have about a half hour to 45 minutes of uh, um, drinks. About an hour, sorry. Um, so you'll be directed. Um, I just wanted to end by saying, just give you a flavor of what we attempt to do in this center, is to bring people from different perspectives and sectors together. Conversation between Arkebi and um, Naila, you know, a longtime development practitioner and a scholar, brings different perspectives on what the development goals are, which are often very contested, and how we might achieve them. And we think this center is not just about an exchange of ideas, but um, bringing people together so they can collaborate to come up with more effective solutions over time. Um, and we think that um, a lot of the development world has a set of incoherent wish lists, like the SDGs, which if you achieve progress on all of them, you would have to, do, you'd have to give up on some of them. It's an incoherent wish list. We hope to move development thinking more to strategic thinking about how a coherent plan can be devised and implemented and adapted over time. And we think because the world is very uncertain and it's very interrelated in its risks and uncertainties, that you can't really have coherent strategies unless you bring practitioners, sectors, and disciplines together to discuss that problem together. There's too many developments designs that are based on blueprints. There's too much discussion of lessons learned from other countries without specifying the geopolitical and internal political factors that allowed those things to succeed. Nyla mentioned the word replicability. We want to connect dots of history and political economy and current trends in a way that make for more coherent thinking strategically. So I'm going to um, stop here. And um, we um, have a quick photo um, session before we go. But I invite everyone to go to the cloisters for the reception, which is, starts now. Thanks for coming, and thank you for Hyundai for funding us. <laughs> <laughs>